guys and welcome back thanks for clicking so this particular doctor named James White said 99.9% of all Muslims have never seen this in the Quran let's check it out um, the text of the Quran I'm going to show you some things over the next 15 minutes that 99.999997% of all Muslims in the world have never seen. I presented this material in a debate in uh, Queens about two years ago in a debate with Imam Shamsi Ali. We were in this huge Presbyterian church, but it was a really liberal Presbyterian church, so there hadn't been more than 20 Presbyterians in this church at one time for about 50 years. That's what liberalism does to you. Beautiful church. Seated a thousand people, standing room only, and 800 of them were Muslims. And when I got to this point where I started showing some of the stuff I'm going to show you, it was the deer in the headlight thing. What are you talking about? I'd never seen anything like this before. Have I woken you up now? Good, good. The the Muslim believes, remember the Quran is probably still over here someplace, right? Has it moved over here yet? Okay, it's slowly moving. It may get over to here tomorrow night. <laughs> I need to start carrying more than one of those. But I, you know one of the reasons I don't carry more than one Arabic Quran? You know how many times I have found a we inspected your bag TSA thing inside my Arabic Quran? I think someone's trying to give me a message. And I feel like going in there and saying, dudes, I'm the Christian. And like, but they, didn't, they don't get that message. Um, the Muslim believes that that Quran is exactly what Muhammad dictated as the Quran came down. And they look at us and they go, oh, okay. How many of you have the ESV? Come on, how many of you have the ESV? How many have the NIV? How many of you have the New American Standard? How many have the King James? How many have the New King James? How many have the NRSV? How many have the Living Bible? Don't put your hands up. That was a trick. We will have intervention counseling with you afterwards if you put your hand up for that one. And they look at that and they go, Word of God? How can you have the Word of God? if you've got all these different versions of it. And not only that, those of you who have the ESV and the NIV, okay, let me just do one thing to you here. <laughs> who, who has the ESV? Put your hand up. Who, who has one with you? You have one right there? Sitting on the front row. Okay. Would you please read for me, sir, the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse 4. Everybody has your Bible. If you have a Bible, look it up. John chapter 5, verse 4, in the ESV or the NIV, either one of them. Could you read for me the fourth verse of the fifth chapter of the Gospel of John? Yeah, good luck. There is no fourth verse. It goes from 3 to 5. That's not a typo. It's not a typo. Um, if you're like me and you're past 40 and tiny footnotes now look like smudges of dirt on the page rather than footnotes, you might look down at the bottom of the page. You'll find it, but it's not there anymore. And you see, the Muslim looks at those little footnotes at the bottom of the page that say some manuscripts say this and some manuscripts say that, and they say, we have the perfectly preserved Quran, and all you have is that. Got your attention now? Good. Why? Well, the Quran was basically, <laughs> it's basically a government production. The Quran was controlled. There's a Quran right up front. Uh, and there you go, sir. It had a government controlled textual transmission which resulted in a generally unified textual history. I mean, if you had the federal government behind one particular reading of a text and the power of the sword, that sort of uh, helps that particular reading to become predominant. Uh, the 1924 Egyptian 
edition, which is what is being passed across the front row there, is viewed by most as the official version in Arabic. There are other slightly different versions uh, over in India, Pakistan, uh, maybe down in Indonesia, places like that. Uh, but uh, that's what you have there. Now, <clears throat> there is a major, major difference between the centralized governmental control of the collation and transmission of the Quranic text and the non-centralized, non-controlled transmission of the New Testament. I don't have time tonight to do this, but I wish I had time uh, to share with you how we got our New Testament. Um, if you go on my website, go to my YouTube channel, I have about 530 YouTube videos up and a couple of them include my New Testament uh, presentation on this subject. So if you want to look into that uh, or my book on the King James Only uh, controversy or scripture alone, things like that, we'll address some of these issues. But the New Testament was never controlled by any organization, edited, anything like that. It just simply exploded into the world and as a result, we have John 5, 4, and the questions concerning John 5, 4. Now, is that a bad thing? Well, the Muslim says it is, but the reality is it's not. Let me read some text for you. This, is, this portion is extremely important to understand. Please, please try to... Sometimes I, I sort of watch audiences as I read, and when I start using Arabic names, people just start... You know, checking their watches, if you still wear watches, or you, you know, you get out your iPhone, and you know, you, you know, I saw somebody down front checking their hair with their iPhone. That was pretty cool. It's, it's not a mirror, but you just turn the camera on. Uh, uh, this I don't do that, as you can tell, but uh, don't really have a need to, but I, it's, it's, you know, people start doing stuff. Uh, try, to, try to listen, because I think you're going to see why this is extremely important. This is from, for those of you who are interested, if we have any Muslims with us, this is Sahih al-Bakari, uh, volume 5, pages 509 and 510. Abu Bakr then said to me, Umar has come to me and said, casualties were heavy among the Qura of the Quran, those who knew the Qura by, Quran by heart, on the day of the battle of Yalmama. <laughs> I have just become accustomed to the fact that I need to stop after saying Yalmama, let the laughter roll through the audience and move on. It's just a place name. I'm not saying your mama. But I've just had to get used to it. Okay? There was a battle. This is shortly after the death of Muhammad. And there were men who had memorized, they were called the Qura, who had memorized the Quran. But many of them died that day. Okay? And notice what is being said. And I am afraid that more heavy casualties may take place among the Qura on other battlefields, whereby a large part of the Quran may be lost. Therefore, I suggest you, Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr who is the next caliph, order that the Quran be collected. So what does this tell us? This tells us that when Muhammad died, there was no official version of the Quran. It had been memorized by people, but many of those people died in the, the, the Battle of Yamama. And so there is a concern that a large part of the Quran might be lost. So I started looking for the Quran and collecting it from what was written on palm stalks, thin white stones, and also from the men who knew it by heart, till I found the last ver of, verse of Surat al Taba, Surat on Repentance, with Abi Khuzaimi al Ansari, and I did not find it with anyone other than him. Now think about that. One of the verses he found with, in the memory of one person. One person. Keep that in mind. Then the complete manuscripts, copy of the Quran, remained with Abu Bakr till he died, then with Umar till the end of his life, then with Hafsa, the daughter of Umar. Okay, so there's the first collection. Shortly after Muhammad's death, they collect stuff together from palm stocks, people's memories, and they, they, they collect it together. About 18 years later, Hudayfa was afraid of their, the people of Sham and Iraq's, differences in the recitation of the Quran. So he said to Uthman, Uthman's now the third caliph, O chief of the believers, listen to, this, listen to this interesting statement. Save this nation before they differ about the book, the Quran, as Jews and Christians did before. Hmm. So Uthman sent a message to Hafsa saying, send us the manuscripts of the Quran so that we may compile the Quranic materials in perfect copies and re return the manuscripts to you. And when they had written many copies, Uthman returned the original manuscripts to Hafsa.
Uthman sent to every Muslim province one copy of what they had copied and ordered that all the other Quranic materials, whether written in fragmentary manuscripts or whole copies, be burnt. This is called the Uthmanic Revision. It takes place around 650 AD, about 20 years or so after uh, Muhammad's death. And so Uthman comes up with his version and he sends those versions off to the main Islamic centers and says, this is the official version, burn everything else. Burn everything else. Now that creates a very stable text, but what's the one thing you have to absolutely be certain of? Uthman had to get it right. The problem is, who is the last prophet? Muhammad, not Uthman. Uthman's not inspired. You see, it's real nice to have someone come along and make an edited version for you, as long as they get it right. But you see, the problem is, if they don't get it right, and they destroy what they used beforehand, now you can't get past that point in the history of the text, unlike the New Testament, where we never had an Uthman. We never had somebody come along and edit and create a final version. It's a much better situation. Ibn Abi Dawood in his book Kitab al-Masahif, page 23 says, many of the passages of the Quran that were sent down were known by those who died on the day of Yamama, but they were not known by those who survived them, nor were they written down, nor had Abu Bakr, Umar, or Uthman by that time collected the Quran, nor were they found with even one person after that. Some of the Quran was lost? Well, a Christian writing in AD 830, the Apology of Al-Kindi says, Then the people fell to variance in their readings. Some read according to the version of Ali, which they followed the present day. Some read according to the collection of which we have made mention. One party read according to the text of Ibn Masud, who was one of the companions of Muhammad. And another read of that of Ubay ibn Kab. When Uthman came to power and people everywhere differed in their reading, Ali sought grounds of accusation against him. One man would read a verse one way, another man another way, and there was change in interpolation, some copies having more and some less. When this was represented to Uthman and the danger urged of division, strife, and apostasy, he thereupon caused it to be collected together all the leaves and scraps that he could, together with a copy that was written out at first. Notice this is exactly what the Muslim sources say too, but this is a Christian. But they did not interfere with that which was in the hands of Ali or of those who followed his reading. Ubay was dead by this time. As for Ibn Masud, they demanded his exemplar, but he refused to give it up. Ubay ibn, uh, uh, ibn, Masud, ibn, ibn Masud would not give up his copy of the Quran. And textually speaking, we can find evidence of that even to this day. It is reported from Is Ismail ibn Ibrahim, I'll skip the rest of the names just to get done here. Let none of you say, I have acquired the whole of the Quran. How does he know what all of it is when much of the Quran has disappeared? Rather, let him say, I have acquired what has survived. The early generations, I don't have time to expand upon this, but the early generations of Islamic writers recognized that there were textual variations and issues in regards to the collection and transmission of the text of the Quran. Many Muslims believe the Quran has no meaningful textual history, that the Quran they possess today is a mirror image of Uthman's version, as if uh, Uthman just put it on a photocopier and passed it on to us today. But the fact is that there are textual variants in the early copies of the Quran and evidence of an early editing process seeking to remove Ibn Masud and Ubay ibn Qab's influence, and here is where I will show you those very things. And that looks just like that there. Here is Surah 3158. Here is a variant that is found there. Here is the text under consideration which speaks of Allah surely gathering those who die to himself. Here is the same text from the Quranic manuscript 328 found in the National Library of France in Paris is dated to around a hundred years after Hijra, so within the first hundred years of the history of the Quran. Just as reading Hijazi text is hard even for those who read modern Arabic text, let's expand it, make it a little bit larger. Now what you can see is that the Paris manuscript has an extra olive not found in the modern printed Quranic text. But in this case, that extra olive completely changes the meaning. In the ancient text, it says those who die will not be gathered to a law, while the modern 1924 printed text says they will surely be gathered to a law. 
Now please make sure you understand why I point this out. I'm not saying we can't figure out the original reading. I'm pointing out how important it is to have a full, unedited, widely dispersed manuscript tradition with which to make such determinations. And you will notice, I could turn to this page in the Quran for you, if it's wherever it is, somewhere probably back here, somewhere. And you won't find a, t a footnote that tells you that there's a variant. We have it at John 5, 3. Here's a variant. You just won't find a critical edition of the Quran that tells you that. Which would you rather have? Would you rather know about John 5, 4? Or would you rather just not know about John 5, 4? Truth-loving people want to know the history of their text. Let me show you some more. There's the will surely and will not. There you have the actual... Uh, and by the way, uh, I'm not pulling this off the web someplace by God's grace um, and the support of God's people. Uh, this is a photocopy from the museum quality copy I have of the Par Paris Quran. When it's open, it's this wide and that tall. And there's about two or three sets of those in the United States. I have one of them. They're about $1,400 a piece. Uh, so I made these photocopies myself uh, of where the variants are. Now regarding uh, Surah 1793, Abd al-Razak mentions a tradition from Mujahid. We did not know what a house of ornament Zukruf was until we saw in the Qara of Ibn Masud a house of gold. The fact is there were competing readings in the earliest centuries, the transmission of the Quran, specifically the tradition of Ibn Masud, as well as that of Ubay ibn Qab, persisted in the earliest manuscripts long after Uthman attempted to enforce a particular set of readings. This can be seen in Surah 1793. There is the text, as you would see it, in that Quran that's going around right now. There's the blow-up of the text. The current reading found in the Uthmanian version of the current 1924 Egyptian, speaks of a house of ornament, Zukruf, while Ibn Masud has a house of gold, the Hab. Now once again, without the materials destroyed by Uthman, how does one logically and truthfully determine which is the correct reading? Once you make a revision, once you destroy those things, how can you know? We can go back to earlier and earlier manuscripts, but if you destroy all that stuff, how can you know? There's a difference between the two. And this is one of the most interesting ones. Surah 2, 222 provides another example, this time based upon Fogg's palimpsest manuscript. If you get anything tonight, you're going to be able to get home and amaze your friends and family that you know what a palimpsest is. <laughs> hey, what did you do tonight? I found out what a palimpsest is. A palimpsest is a manuscript where you've had one book written on it. Remember, these are animal skins, so they can be washed off. And so you've washed the ink off of the previous book and you've put something else on top of it. I mean, not many of us have too many cows in the backyard. We can go out and kill just to have some extra writing paper. So you wanted to reuse this kind of stuff. So a palimpsest is where by using infrared or ultraviolet light, you're able to go back and read what was originally written because when you would write with a, a quill or something, you would actually scratch the surface. So you can actually go back and read what was written originally underneath these things. The Fogg's Palimpsest Manuscript is a manuscript of an early version of the Quran uh, that represents the perspective of Ibn Masud. And so what you can see here, when we read the original text in Fogg's, Fogg's manuscript of Surah 2.222, which I hear here on the top, and compare the current edition, we see not just variation, we see wholesale editing. Words are changed, the word order is changed, verbal forms are altered, grammatical terminations are changed, etc. This is clear evidence of the continued attempt, at least a century after Uthman, of ridding the Quran of the readings of Ibn Masud. Now, that may just look like a bunch of scribbles to you, but anyone who can read Arabic knows that while those two lines have very similar meanings, they have been edited. There has been a purposeful editing and changing that has taken place here in this material. This is why Sufyan al-Fawri's relatively short tafsir, for instance, we're almost done, can list 67 variant readings, 24 of which are attributed to Ibn Masud. What is that? That's one of the early tafsirs. It's a commentary on the Quran. And in those early years, they didn't have any problem talking about, well, some manuscripts say this and some manuscripts say that. Wow, that would be unheard of today. I mean, the vast majority of Muslims you talk to do not know that there are differences. 
Now the existence of these textual issues has been well known to Muslim scholars for centuries, but has fallen out of general Islamic recognition, especially in our lifetimes. And here's a good example. Here is just one page of many to be found in the 2007 Turkish publication of the top copy manuscript, listing variations between the major early chronic manuscripts. These lists are produced by Islamic scholars, not Orientalists and not Christians. Now that's not a completely critical text, but that's again from my library. I got the cheapy version, the expensive version was 5,000 bucks, couldn't quite afford that, so I've got the $250 version. Um, but there are a number of pages of these graphs from Muslims documenting these variations in these major manuscripts of the Quran. How many of the Muslims today know this? Very, very, very few. You know, particular, you know, uh, evidence the man read, um, the verses he read to prove his point. I don't know how true it is, but you know, all I can say is that is it true that 99% of Muslims don't know about this? Is it true? And if it's not true, then why is it that this man came to say this? Or is it that he encountered some few Muslims that don't really know much about this? And what made him? do his research like i'm just so perplexed the fact that this man went to do his personal research what led to his research and for him to conclude that most of muslims don't know this or is it because he got to know some few muslims and through that he's not generalizing it or need or is he very very conversant or close to a lot of muslims like this was beautiful to watch. I hope you enjoyed. Like I'm trying to understand, you know, as a novice, I don't really know much, much about this verses. So let's keep the discussion going in the comment box. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.